Hello everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today for the lecture Why does biodentin push the limits of vital pup therapy? All Cetodont team is very happy to welcome Professor Abu. Professor Abu, thank you so much for your participation today. We will be together around 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of questions. The mics are in mute, so please use the chat and we will answer to your question at the end of the lecture. The webinar will be recorded and we will send you the link to the video uh, within 48 hours. Thank you again, Professor Abu, for your lecture and uh, I'll let you begin. Well, thank you very much, Emily, and thanks to Don for organizing this webinar, which is timely given the fact that many countries are locked down with the COVID-19. And I'm sorry that I start by, by this, but uh, this is the fact, and this is what we are living nowadays. So thank you for organizing the webinar, and thanks to Don for this effort, which is useful to all of us. Um, I start my presentation by showing, showing you some, some photos from Marseille. I know that uh, many cannot travel, if not all. So this is a beautiful view of the um, Calanque, which is a national park. Uh, this is one of the pictures I took, but you have plenty of Calanques and they are very, very nice, just in the outskirts of, of Marseille. And in Marseille, we have plenty of monuments. I will just show you one of them, which is called Palais Longchamp. Palais Longchamp was a monument built to celebrate the water arrival to Marseille from La Durance. By the time was, uh, it, it was, Marseille was short in water, it turned out that water never came this way. And now uh, this monument has two museums, which is uh, for the well-being of the inhabitants of Marseille. This is a beautiful view of the old harbor of Marseille. And this city is located in the south of France on the Mediterranean. It's a city with 2,600 years of history. And you see it's a combination of the old, of the entrance of the harbor and the modern. So this is a national museum, which is called Museum for the Mediterranean and European Civilizations. And this is an administrative building. And these are very nice buildings. And they are unique in the sense that they have um, a kind of amphitheater and cinema underneath the water level. So today I'm going to talk to you about biodentine and how does biodentine push the limits of vital bulb therapy. So this is rather a provocative title and um, I hope we will be able to, to explain things together and to see what is new related to the material science and what is new related to our understanding of the pulp function and to the pulp interaction with biomaterials. So in fact, when we are in clinic, what we usually look at is the material, its aspect, and also uh, the overall result and the outcome of the treatment. What quite often we forget is that uh, we are putting a material on a living tissue. So this is how I would show you the pulp is. So you put a material here on a living tissue, which is called uh, the pulp. And when you put the material, you put it on an inflamed tissue. This is what you see here in almost blue with many inflammatory cells. And this needs to be taken into consideration, which is not always the case. And once you put the material, you should consider also that the pulp has a regeneration potential. This have, has been investigated in many studies, but I will show you some of the recent data that we have. And you need to know something which is really very new, that is what happens to infiltrating bacteria. For many of us, when there is bacteria, it's over, there's nothing to do. And I will show you that the pulp has an, an enormous capacity to defend itself and even to kill cariogenic bacteria. So now when you have applied the material on the pulp, it will interact through the byproducts with the inflamed tissue, as you see here, but also with the healthy intact tissue. And this is also very important. So now 
Um, Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just having some uh, difficulty with the visibility of, of my screen. So now I'm going to talk to you about uh, Bayadantin and its development. Uh, there's no way to say it uh, rather than saying that Bayadantin has been developed as a, a partnership between the Faculty of Dentistry of Marseille and um, the National Institute of Science uh, Scientific Research with Septodont. And the idea was to develop a new class of material having high mechanical properties to be used as a bulk fill material with a biocompatibility, of course, and ability to induce the target tissue uh, specific functions with the idea of developing a new dentin substitute. So before I start, uh, talking about Bayetantin, need to tell you that my background is that I'm professor at the Faculty of Dentistry in Marseille and I'm heading the research lab of this faculty and working with my team on the pulp biology and regeneration since about 25 years now and we are actively involved in developing materials and we were highly involved in the development of Bayetantin. And um, on the, at this level, I can tell you some, uh, let's say, secrets, which are not secrets about this material and what is particular in it. So, you know, this material is rather new. It has been released in Europe by the end of 2010, and I know it's known all over the world nowadays. And the material is presented as a liquid and a powder. And what is special about its composition is the following is that it's a powder and a liquid. This is something you know, but maybe you, what uh, many don't focus on is that it has ultra pure tricalcium silicate. And this is unique about this material. Also, it has a radio opacifier, which is zirconium oxide, and this opacifier does not stain the tooth once treated. On the other side, we have the liquid, and please note that the liquid is not water. It is a liquid because it contains some other components. So you cannot consider this as water because it contains calcium chloride as a sitting accelerator. And if this material doesn't have uh, calcium chloride, you will need to ask the patient to open the, mouth, open the mouth for three days and he will not be happy about it. And the other thing which is particular about this liquid is that there is a hydrosoluble polymer. And this allows to, allows to reduce the amount of water that is incorporated into the material. And this is very important for maintaining or for obtaining um, good mechanical properties. So this is how the material is presented, a liquid and a powder. And again, please remember, it is a liquid and not powder, not water. So, if you want a material with the proper mechanical properties, you need to respect the ratios between the liquid and powder. And if you do not respect this, you will not get the optimal properties of the material. Now, when you get the material, you will uh, mix the powder and the liquid, and it's so precise, you put five drops of the liquid into the powder, you mix for 30 seconds, with an amalgamator, and then you apply in the cavity without any uh, prayer preparation or itching. So what happens when you mix the powder and the liquid is the following. You solubilize a part of the particles of tricalcium silicate with the liquid. That will produce what we call hydrogel. So the hydrogel will precipitate between and on the surface of the uh, tricalcium silicate particles. And once sitting is obtained, you reduce the porosity of the material. And when you reduce the porosity of the material, as you can see here, that means you will increase the mechanical properties. Also, the setting reaction produces uh, hydroxyl ions and calcium hydroxide and some other components that we will uh, discuss at a later stage. And these are very important for the function and for the regeneration uh, of the tertiary dentin uh, for the protection of the pulp. Now, if you look at the porosity of bayadentin, 
as a percentage, you see that it's very low. It's compar comparable to Fuji 9, which means that you have a material which, which is not porous. And if it is not porous, that means it has uh, good mechanical properties. And indeed, when you look at the compressive strength, for example, of this material, you see that by one hour, it is similar to Fuji 9. And the compressive strength of the material increases with time. So when you look at it after 24 hours, it exceeds that of uh, Fuji 9. And when you look at it at 21 days, it is similar to the natural dentin. This is a very important property because by this period, you can shape and cut by dentin the way you will cut dentin with the bars exactly in the same way. So this is why we consider this material as a real dentin substitute and it is used in different applications in the crown and in the root. And here is a clinical case, for example, where direct pulp capping was performed on immature permanent teeth. The cavity was filled with um, bidentine, as you can see here. And then after six months, you see that there is formation of dentin bridge. So the dentin was placed. And then um, after three months, bidentine was removed, leaving one millimeter layer. And then the permanent restoration was performed. So you can put the material as a bulk fill, then you can reshape it and then put a uh, composite resin over it. Now, when we want to look at the successful treatment uh, of any restoration, we need to consider uh, some elements and the factors influencing the pulp response. This is not a surprise for you. They are um, not many, but the one and the first and the most important is the presence of bacteria and the sealing capacity of the material. So once you place the material, the material should have some antibacterial properties and also it should provide a good marginal sealing. So when biodentine was compared to other materials like MTA or glassy animal cement, uh, it was reported that biodentine was efficient against several uh, bacterial species I can tell you that this is due, <coughs> I'm sorry for coughing, it is due to the alkaline pH, due to the hydroxyl ions that are produced. And these uh, results are very important to provide an inhibition of bacterial growth once the material is placed. And when the material is applied, of course, there should be no marginal leakage around and through the restoration. And the restoration should allow the tertiary dentin formation. So in case of a superficial lesion uh, that is a dentin injury, we get this um, reactionary dentin that is produced. And if you have pulp exposure, you need the presence of stem cells, and these stem cells have to migrate to produce the tertiary dentin. I will come back to this a little bit later on. Regarding the marginal sealing of the material that can be applied without any preparation of the dentin surface, there was a study done at King's College where the authors mixed the material with a fluorescent dye. And what you see is that the fluorescent dye penetrates in the dentin tubules. And this was impressive, which means that the dye penetrates into the tubules, producing kind of plugs into these openings. And when you look at this on, by scanning electron microscopy, you see that there are some plugs into the dentin tubules, and this allows a micromechanical anchorage in ensuring a long-lasting seal. Now, this material in the same study was applied on the dentin slice, and you see with the glass humor, the tubules are open here, but when biodentin is applied, they are completely obliterated. This was also a control on the opposite side of glass humor, the tubules are open and the opposite side of biodentine are open. But when you apply biodentine, they are obliterated. And this may explain why the sensitivity after biodentine application decreases and the patient report little or no pain. Now, when you have um, um, 
deep injury with pulp exposure, you need migration and um, differentiation of stem cells. And it has been reported since severe, several years that the dental pulp has a high regeneration potential. It has many niches and population of stem cells, whether these are um, permanent teeth or deciduous, and there is a population even in the apical papilla, and these cells are present in primary and permanent teeth and all ages. And this is important to know for the next steps of our presentation. So what do these cells do? When we have a carious injury, a deep carious injury, and when we have a pulp exposure, these cells will produce what we call the tertiary dentin that you see here. So the questions that we are going to ask now is, how do these stem cells recognize the injury or the carious site? Can the pulp arrest cariogenic bacteria? Because when you look at the tooth here, you see carious dentin and you see the tertiary dentin. And we always learn that there is no regeneration if there is infection. So how does this regeneration occur in spite of the fact that we are having bacterial uh, infiltration into the dentin. And then when we apply the bay material, what will happen to this situation, to this bacteria or to this uh, stem cell which is migrating? So when we look at this, and this is our work as researchers, is to understand what happened. So we made a kind of survey of the type of injuries that you have in the pulp and uh, you don't need to be very uh, strong and very smart to do, to do this. It's very easy. We have only three situations where we can get dentin pulp regeneration. And this is after carious injury, traumatic injury with pulp exposure, and when you apply a pulp capping material, which indicates also that you have already an injury. And these situations have a common point together that all of them activate what we call the complement. So they lead to the complement activation. Now you, you may wonder what is this complement and what is this complement activation? Just imagine it like the coagulation system. It is silent under normal conditions and once you have infection or injury, it is activated to eliminate the infectious agents and to decrease the inflammation. So, this complement activation leads to the production of active molecules, and these active molecules play important roles in the inflammation process. This is what is known so far. <coughs> so among these, you have the anaphylatoxins that increase the vessel permeability and um, attract inflammatory cells. There are opsonins like C3B, which opsonize the pathogens, that is, they fix on the pathogens and stimulate its phagocytosis. And there is a membrane attack complex. This is a complex structure which fixes on the microorganism and can explode it literally. So it's an efficient system. And now when you think of the pulp, the pulp, pulp is um, an organ with a terminal circulation. It has too many particular aspects. And we thought that this uh, might produce some of the complement proteins. I would like just to remind you that the only organ that is known to produce the complement proteins is the liver and some inflammatory cells. And when we studied the expression of these proteins in the bulb, we found that these, the full fibroblasts produce many, many complement proteins. The only two that are missing are C3 and C6. And when we incubate these with um, LTA lipoteicoic acid of gram positive bacteria, what happens is that we have the expression of these molecules. So, what does this mean? That means when we have an injury with bacteria, something happens. So, what is this that happens? We simulated this situation in culture. So, here we have the fibroblast. We add LTA as if we are adding gram positive bacteria like cariogenic bacteria. Then we take the supernatant and we measure what is in there. And in 20 minutes, we have a significant increase of this bioactive molecule, which is called C5A, after LTA stimulation. What happens after injury is exactly the same thing. 
we have an increase in the, the expression and the synthesis of this uh, bioactive molecule after fibroblast injury. What does this mean and what can this bring us? So look at this migration chamber. If we add C5A from one side and we put stem cells in the middle, and or if we put fibroblasts. So look, if we put fibroblasts here, so these are the fibroblasts. And if you look at the colored dots, you notice that the cells will not migrate. The colored dots will remain at the same place. So these are the fibroblasts. Now, if you look at the other side with this small video, and we look at the stem cells, and we have applied a gradient of C5A in the same way. So look at what happens. Here, what happens is that the cells migrate and their migration goes towards C5A. What does this mean? This means something very simple, which is the following. So if we put stem cells in the middle and if we plate fibroblasts on both sides of the chamber, and when we add LTA as if we are having infection on this side, stem cells will migrate towards LTA. That means towards the infection. This is how stem cell recognize the injury site and the infection site. Now what happens sometimes is that we see this type of Im images. And this type of images indicates that this is icaries, these are bacteria, the black color, and this is tertiary dentin. And we always learn that there is no regeneration if we have infection. So what happens in this case? What we notice is that the fibroblasts produce another complex structure, which is called membrane attack complex. And this membrane attack complex can fix on bacteria, can literally explode bacteria. So in order to understand and to study this, we incubated the fibroblast with or without LTA, and we incubated the medium that is obtained with cariogenic bacteria, Streptococcus mutans and Sangridis. And what we notice is that when we have LTA like here, we have an increased fixation on bacteria. Um, in the same way, when we look at this carious tooth, we notice that this is the presence of streptococcus mutants, and you see the membrane attack complex, that is the, the active molecule, is fixed on these bacteria on the same location. Now, what happens if this bacteria penetrates in, into the pulp? So first of all, when the bacteria penetrate into the pulp, we simulated this by plating fibroblasts with bacteria directly. So what you see here in green is the fibroblast. You see here the bacteria, but when you, we plate them together, you don't distinguish bacteria. But later on, when we incubate them together for 30 minutes, you see that the membrane attack complex is now fixed on bacteria and the bacteria appear in red. So this is the case for superbotulism mutants on sanguinis. And if we inhibit the fixation, we have no complex on bacteria. In a very simple way, if we incubate the cells with LTA and we take the supernatant and we put it on bacteria, we see that it inhibits bacteria. It kills bacteria. It kills cariogenic bacteria. So the complement complex produced by the fibroblast can kill cariogenic bacteria. So in practice, what does this mean? This means that if you have bacteria infiltrating the bulb, that will stimulate fibroblasts to produce the membrane attack complex. The membrane attack complex is fixed on cariogenic bacteria and induce bacterial lysis. So this has been reviewed this year and has just been accepted in clinical or investigation. So in clinic, what does this bring us? And uh, what can we um, draw as conclusions from it? There is a very known situation, which is the um, partial pulpotomy after tooth fracture. So there was a good study that was published um, in 2015, and that was surprising. And that shows you the pulp potential to uh, resist to infection. That was uh, four clinical cases, um, tooth fracture, that was between five and 90 days back. I know that for many of you, if it is over 24 hours, 
you um, take the pulp out. But here they did, did another thing that they excised the tissue to a depth of two millimeter, then they placed biodentine over it and they built the structure at the same appointment. And look, this is biodentine, and here the dentin bridge which formed after 18 months. This is not to tell you that this is the, um, the normal and the standard practice nowadays, but just to tell you that knowledge of the material, uh, marginal sealing, antibacterial potential, and the pulp regeneration and antibacterial potential can open up new horizons for the application of biomaterials. Now, when we consider applying the material on this um, kind of situation, what happens is the following. <coughs> that we need to remember always that the pulp response is not only regeneration, it's always a balance between inflammation and regeneration. And this is what will determine the success of any treatment. And if you remember well, when, whenever you look any any clinical trial with histological evaluation, you see this type of things. You see dentin bridge formation. This is with MTA and biodentine, not with a resin-containing material. And then soon after, but many of us forget to look at it, there is the inflammation. And there is the evaluation of inflammation. And this is very important. So when you have severe inflammation, you will not have any regeneration. And when you have moderate or mild inflammation, you might have the regeneration depending on the material you will use. Now, let me bring you back to the facts that restorative materials are applied onto injured and inflamed carious tissues. And the application of these tissues affects the inflammatory and regeneration potentials and I will show you the effects on the initial steps. And this is particularly true in the pulp, which is located within inextensible and rigid dentinal walls. Because when you have an inflammation on the skin, it's not too important that the skin swells, even if it swells too much. But if the pulp swells, and if it swells too much, that means necrotic tissue. That means uh, tissue necrosis for the pulp. So what we did to understand this is that we selected three types of materials. Of course, we used biodentine that we know very well. Then we used um, resin bonding system, Xeno, and we used a mixed material that is a light cured tricalcium silicate for different reasons. This uh, represents kind of a step in between tricalcium silicates and resins. And we want to see if there is any effect of these materials on inflammation and regeneration. First of all, I will remind you the steps, the initial steps of inflammation. So when you have a carious lesion and when you apply a, a material or just when you have the inflammation, you will first have production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So this is the first step then you will have swelling and adhesion of inflammatory cells on the endothelial cells then you will have their migration and then they will go to the bacteria present site will, where they will carry out phagocytosis so these are the initial steps and we wanted to see the effect of these materials on these steps so first of all what is the effect of on pro-inflammatory cytokines. We took fibroblasts, we plated them making injuries and as if they are treated with LTA, as if they are having a carious injury. We incubate them with the material extracts. Then we took the supernatant and we measure the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So here I'm showing you two, but we have done, done several ones, including um, TNF-alpha and IL-8. And what you see is that with injury, there is an increase of these factors, but the increase that we noticed with bidentine was much less than with that with thoracal or xeno. Now, the next was to look at the inflammatory cell adhesion on vascular endothelium. So here, what you see is the inflammatory cell on the endothelial cells that are behind. And you notice that when you have tricalcium silicates like bidentine, um, we, you have a decreased adhesion of inflammatory cells 
on the endothelium. And the third step was to look at the chemotaxis, that is the attraction of inflammatory cells to the, to the application side of the material. And you notice that vadentin decreases the inflammatory cell chemotaxis towards the material application site, which means that it will decrease the inflammation. And the last step is the activation of these cells to carry out phagocytosis. And when these cells are activated, they release hydraulic enzymes and they, are, they can induce lesions to the tissues. And we notice again that there's a significant decrease with biodentin, which is not the case. And the opposite is obtained with, with xeno 3 so overall, this means if I take the same scheme that I've shown you at the beginning, so this is the initial step of adhesion, migration, and activation. We notice that tricalcium silicate, such as bayodontine, will inhibit adhesion, inhibit migration, and activation of these cells. So in practice, what does this mean when this is applied in the clinic? This is the inflammation of the pulp, and what you see here is plenty of inflammatory cells. These are neutrophils and macrophages. This is a schematic drawing, and this area is the inflammatory area. So once you apply vadentin, what happens is that you will decrease the inflammation. So these cells will not come, they will not be present in the pulp. That means the bulb volume will decrease because these cells disappear, uh, blood vessels will shrink, and that means that there is a decreased blood pressure. And when you have a decreased blood pressure, that means you have a decreased pain. And this correlates well to what we notice in the clinical trials, that when biodontin is applied, there is a decrease in pain um, that was reported by the patients. Now, in a similar way, if we look at the initial steps of regeneration, what we notice is the following, that the initial steps by the release of growth factors that affect the stem cells inducing their proliferation, these cells migrate and on the material surface, they will differentiate and mineralize. So what would happen uh, if the materials are applied, we did a similar thing. So we take extracts of the material, we make injuries, and we apply the material extract on the cells, and then we measure the growth factors. What we found out is that there are two major factors that are produced and significantly increasing with um, biodentine. That was TGF beta one and FGF two. So what does FGF two do? is that this factor increases the proliferation of stem cells, which is required for regeneration. TGF beta 1 increases whatever the surface area of the sample is, which means that it can be used whether you have a small injury or a big injury like partial or full pulpotomy. And in order to understand what this factor can do, what we did is that we isolated stem cells, we placed them in a migration system, and then we incubated them with TGF beta 1 on site or FGF2 and checked the migration of these cells. And what happens is the following at the beginning, the cells have no direction. So if you look here, there is a reference point, and the cells are here after three days. Now, please look at the cells where they go after four days seven and ten days they go towards the right and the right is the direction of tgf beta one so at the end they go towards tgf beta one and tgf beta one was the place where the material was applied so if i can show you this video you will see these cells that will migrate towards tgf beta one and look at this for example how it runs to go to tgf beta one and tgf beta one is the place where either Bayodontine or MTA has been placed. So in practice, when you apply Bayodontine, the stem cells that are on blood vessels, they will migrate, they will follow a gradient, and they will go towards Bayodontine application site, and there they will produce the dentin bridge. So if you look at the clinical trials and what they have reported, you see this. 
that we have with tricalcium silicate, a complete bridge that is formed after eight weeks, but with resin containing materials, you don't have the internal bridge, you don't have protection. So these are the effects related to the interaction of the material with the initial step of inflammation and regeneration. Now, there are also some effects that are due to the material itself. And that is when the material sets and it is hydrated, there are some hydration byproducts that are produced. And these byproducts, I have mentioned maybe one or two of them, calcium hydroxide is known to produce a necrotic zone and mineralization, which contributes to the dentin bridge formation. We have calcium ions that are involved in the pulp cell differentiation and mineralization, and again, contribute to dentin bridge and periapical tissue regeneration. Hydroxyl ions uh, are responsible for the alkaline pH that inhibits bacterial growth and contribute to the marginal sealing. And then silicium ions, they are known to induce osteoblastic differentiation, and these are involved in bone regeneration, such as what we observe in periapical bone regeneration. Also, silicium ions are involved in stem cell differentiation and neuralization, and all this contributes to the dentin bridge formation and periapical tissue regeneration. I have just also shown you that the interaction with the material directly with the tissues lead to TJB to one release and differentiation and recruitment of stem cells towards my dentin application site. So you see, it's only not only the pulp which can be induced, but also bone and periodontal ligaments that can be induced to form bone and periodontal ligament. And this is why periodontin has many applications wherever the dentin is lost. So in many um, situations, it is used in the root, like for the like for percussion perforation, external resorption, regenerative endodontics, and so on. And the major part of these are, as you see, case reports. But in the crown, there are many, many applications, and you see something particular that in the first study, but this is not the only one, that bidentine can replace the enamel in a temporary way up to six months. And in many clinical situations, uh, Bidentine has been evaluated in a clinical trial and even with histology and many papers have appeared recently. The latest group that started working on uh, the material is in palpotomy in children and this is for reasons that we all understand that is the protection of children and so on. But once they started, they blew up the competition and they are doing too much and this seems to be a very friendly material. Uh, for the channel. Now you might uh, ask the question, what are the limits of the use of this material? So um, when the material was released, there were two limits. The first was the aesthetic restoration of anterior teeth because it appears as white gray, it's not too aesthetic for anterior teeth. And then that there was also irreversible pulpitis. And this, with the current knowledge on what we know of the pulp regeneration potential, anti-inflammatory potential of the material and the pulp capacity to kill bacteria, this is even challenged nowadays. And if you look in the literature, you see many papers where pyodontin is used to treat teeth with uh, full pulpotomy and partial pulpotomy after carious exposure. So this is a study in uh, young adolescents and children. And this material was used up to one year with a very high success rate. As you can see, it's about, um, I don't see it, but it's uh, around 90 something percent. In the same way, this was done also in adult patients and the success, so you see 19 to 69 with full pulpotomy, pulpotomy and the success rate was 100% clinical and radiographic above 98. 
and the follow-up was for one year. And a recent publication has appeared where the follow-up was much longer with partial polypotomy and irreversible pulpitis. So you see almost four years follow-up. And this was uh, reported with a very high success rate, 92 and 87. So if I show you just one of these, two of these cases with MTA, you see here, preoperative positive, and this is 38 months. And here, what you see with Bayadentine, it's almost five years. So it looks like uh, irreversible pulpitis is, um, is challenged and it's possible to consider treatment of um, this condition. Now, there was a paper which has just been published by Dr. Taha summarizing all the studies that reported success of uh, bioactive materials in irreversible pulpitis treatment that you see here. And you see that with biodentine, calcium enriched mixture, MTA, and um, in some um, studies we had also calcium hydroxide, there is a real success rate of this treatment. So it's not yet the stand, standard treatment, but uh, there are many studies advocating its use in irreversible pulpitis. And this is also partial pulpotomy, and you see that different materials, including MTA, uh, calcium rich material and bayadentine with a very high success success rate. This is what you see here, mainly in irreversible pulpitis. And the only one which has a quite low success rate is when calcium hydroxide is used, the success rate is rather low. So this brings us to the fact that if several materials can be successful in this indication, uh, a question which I get very, very often is what makes the difference between biodentine and calcium hydroxide or between biodentine and MTA. So if we compare biodentine to calcium hydroxide, it is, of course, stronger mechanically, less soluble, and it has a better sealing ability. You know the tunnel defects that are produced in the bridge produced under calcium hydroxide in several studies. And if the material is compared to MTA, uh, bidentine is easier to handle, of course, stronger mechanically, shorter setting time, and it can be used as a temporary animal substitute. And at this time point, I have to tell you that the biggest study that was done on the use of this material as animal substitute was published in clinical investigation. It was done in Marseille. And it was a high number of cases where bayadentine was used as a bulk restorative material. And uh, in function of time, a superficial erosion occurred. So the material was reshaped and a resin was applied on it. And that study demonstrated that bayadentine can be used, of course, as a dentin substitute, as a permanent dentin substitute, but it could be also used as a um, a temporary animal substitute for up to six months. So the material is a real permanent dentin substitute. It's a bulk fill material. So um, I always hear that people are still using it as if it is a capping material like MTA. No, please remember this material is resistant. Is It has the same mechanical properties as uh, dentin and should be considered and treated as such, not only as a bulk capping material. And also what you must have heard is that this material produces no discoloration of the tooth crown like the ones produced with MTA. And this is mainly due to the fact that in MTA and derivatives, the radio opacifier is um, bismuth oxide, while in bidentine it is zirconium oxide. So I hope with this that I have shown you that the pulp has a high regeneration potential. The novelty that I hope that you got it right from now is that the pulp can really kill cariogenic bacteria. So if we have pulp exposure and you flush the pulp to remove all bacteria and you have some residual ones or you have a small infiltration of bacteria, the pulp can kill bacteria and can resist. 
that biodentin has an anti-inflammatory potential. This is very important when the pulp is inflamed. This is a discomfort to the patient and pain. And biodentin modulates the balance between inflammation and regeneration, of course, shifting the balance from inflammation to regeneration. And this brought us new perspectives in vital pulp therapy. Well, as I mentioned, it is not still the standard, but um, things are progressing and uh, many studies are done to show that bidentin can be used in irreversible pulpitis treatment. So, so far many papers have been published and even ESC has moved in this sense to say that some, in some situation, uh, full pulpotomy on irreversible pulpitis can be successful, but still long-term studies are requested. And I've shown you a study at least with four years follow-up. So it looks like we are on the right way. With this, I would like to thank you for listening. And I would like to tell you that this work is a teamwork. Uh, many people are working with me, and this is a beautiful view in front of Marseille with beautiful islands and with a blue sea that I hope one day you will come and see it. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for listening and for joining us today. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for sharing with us your, your studies, your case, and the beautiful landscape. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, it was really of a great interest. I think that everybody is very happy with this, that lecture. For the moment, no question. So don't hesitate. Uh, we can answer right now to your questions. So don't hesitate to, to ask. Maybe we can wait one or two minutes uh, during this time. One, maybe one last comment, Professor, about pulp or biodentin. About, sorry about the pulp, about biodentin? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the the story of the pulp and the pulp treatment started long time ago with uh, resin-based materials. And resin-based materials are really not friendly to the pulp. So quite often we had discomfort to the patient, irritation and inflammation. And um, then we came with other materials like tricalcium silicates. These are really friendly to the pulp and they are extremely nice. And the reason why I try to check what happens when we um, use materials that are hybrid, like Thiracal with tricalcium silicate, was a very simple reason is that lately we have noticed that to many, waiting for 12 minutes, they said it was quite long. So some companies developed light cured calcium hydroxide and light cured tricalcium silicate, indicating that the sitting time can be shortened and that the material can keep the advantages of tricalcium silicates or calcium hydroxide. And at the same time, they can bring new advantages of long sitting time and um, uh, easy handling because these materials, for many of them, they are applied with a syringe. The only problem is what we see is the after its application to the pulp, you don't have a protection to the pulp. You have rather an increased inflammation and irritation. You don't have an antibridge formation. And even to me, the setting of this material raises a real problem because tricalcium silicates set upon hydration. So you add water. And all of you know that resins set by photopolymerization with no water. So you should remove water. So we are in a contradictory situation where neither the setting of the resin can be complete, leaving space for many monomers and a lot of monomers to diffuse to the pulp and to, to kill and be toxic to the pulp. And at the same time, we have studied the hydration of biodentin compared to, for example, a material containing resin like Thuracal. And we noticed that Thuracal was not completely hydrated. And you have noticed by the end of my presentation that the hydration byproducts play a major role, not only in the antibacterial um, potential and the marginal sealing, 
but also in inducing the regenerative capacity of the pulp, that is, in producing this tertiary dentin that protects the underlying pulp. Thank you. So, yes, the questions are coming. So, um, what do you mean about leaving uh, a rest of caries dentin in cavity and covering by biodentin? What do I think by leaving a caries, a rest of caries dentin in cavity and covering by biodentin? Well, this is a very good question and it is timely. And this is what um, I know that some dentists try to do this with the COVID in the COVID period. That is the traumatic removal of dentin with uh, hand instruments to avoid spreading of the of the virus, if any. Um, in fact, what I can tell you is that bidentin has, uh, with its pH due to the hydroxide release, has a high alkaline pH. Alkaline pH are known to reduce bacterial proliferation. And you, we should always remember that the, um, the pulp response is always a balance between inflammation and regeneration. So what you do in this situation is that you decrease the load. If you decrease the load, and if you consider that in addition to the material, the pulp also can resist to invade invading bacteria, this situation may be successful. And I know that there are many trials over the world trying to do this. That is keeping a part of the, the infected dentin and build on it, and that might work. And some dentists say that it works. Thank you. Um, uh, is the biodentin sensitive to saliva? Is biodentin sensitive to saliva? Yes, it is. I mentioned that you should respect the ratio between liquid and powder because the amount of liquid will also play a major role on the um, on the mechanical properties of the material. So this is the first point. The second point is saliva contain bacteria. So if you contaminate the material, this is uh, not a very good point. So you should avoid and you should work with the dam always. You should avoid any contamination with saliva. Um, can what? Sorry, what is the bond between biodentin and resin restoratives? What is the bond between between biodentin and resin restoratives? All right, I see the point. Um, what I have shown you is the bond between the material and the dentin and enamel. So the, the, the bond between the material and the resin is, um, is rather mechanical. So you demineralize a part of the dentin and you have like tags be between the resin and by dentin as if it is dentin. But the most important in uh, providing the marginal seal and this is exactly what happens in case you apply calcium hydroxide or MTA is that you bond your material your resin to the dentin and enamel so this is the place where bonding is most important now I can tell you that we did an experimental protocol with um, Fuji 2 light cured being applied on biodentin surface with under different conditions with different techniques and we didn't notice any leakage between um, biodentin and any of these materials whether with self or total etching um, have you had any experience with sdf and biodentin used together no, unfortunately not. I can't say yes. Um, in partial pulpotomy, how much of the pulp should we remove and when do we remove pulp as opposed to pulp capping over it? So how much you remove? You remove of the pulp as much as you feel that the pulp 
is uh, necrotic and altered. So you should remove as much, as far as you feel that the pulp is necrotic, which looks like yellow, you have to remove until you have, you reach the healthy pulp. And if you don't reach this until you go to the uh, canal orifice, you go for full pulpitum. Do you use sodium hypochlorite for disinfection of pulp perforation? Yes, this is what is recommended. But again, um, the idea is to flush the pulp to remove the bacterial load. And I know that some of our colleagues, they use a sterile saline, for example, to decrease the load, but you can use it. Yes, the answer is yes. I think it will be the last one. Can we immediately place a crown of a biodentin without waiting for 12 minutes, especially with child? Well, I would rather suggest if you are in hurry and if you don't want the child to come back. So if you, if you, if you consider a second visit, you can put the material as a bulk fill material then in a second appointment, the child come back and you go for the definitive restoration. Otherwise, um, I know that you what, what you can do is to put a glass ionomer and um, a stainless steel crown or orets, depending on the remaining tooth structures. So this can be done in only one session. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, it was the last questions. Thank you again. And thank you, uh, thank you to everyone. Stay tuned for the next webinar. Thank you, Bye -bye. Amy. Thank you for organizing this. And thank you all for uh, attending. And thank you for the interesting questions. Have a nice You're evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.